I I promised myself I'm not gonna gush like a fanboy, but dude, I got <laughs> got me Brian Ross with me. I it's ridiculous. I love you, man. I love you. I love your wife. I love your kids. I love that church up there in Michigan. I love all the saints. I got Amy Stewart that comes and joins us all the time. I even love Blake Donaldson. I don't know why. <laughs> But I well, did. <laughs> thanks for having me on, Joel. Appreciate being here. I wore my Bigfoot shirt just for you. <laughs> Lori and I Joel. saw that shirt in a store the other day, and and I almost got it for you. I almost got it. We <laughs> laughed our heads off when we saw that thing. How you yeah, doing, we, man? I'm doing well. Yourself? I gotta say, you're looking pretty good. You're looking kind of buff. Are you working out now? Well, you know I am because I told <laughs> you that I was before. <laughs> But yes, I'm uh, this summer, you know, I'm trying to prioritize my physical health a little bit. Um, Good. This is my first week off school. Good. And so I've, yeah, been trying to make some changes along those lines. A few more weeks of that and you're going to be ripped. You're going to be ripped. It's like Dave yeah. Reed in the picture in the intro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got it. I got it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to update the the intro eventually. I, I just grabbed the funniest photos I had and just threw them all together. Um, it is awesome having you here. Now, Brian Ross. Okay, so uh, for everybody in the live chat, if you have any, this is your chance to ask Brian Ross some questions. Um, so if you want, I'm just thinking, um, just put in the live chat question in caps, like Randy White's live stream. And uh, if you want to ask Brian any questions, we, we will, there will be an opportunity to do that. Uh, Brian is arguably the world's preeminent expert on translations, preservation, the history of the King James Bible, uh, I, I can't think of any, I mean, Jordan's up there, but I, I can't think of anybody on planet earth that can hold a candle to Brian Ross on those topics. <laughs> uh, and that's know. not even that's, an understatement. You set so, me up for a major fall here, Joel. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just, I just finished reading yesterday from this generation, uh, volume one, which is phenomenal. That brought back a lot of wonderful memories from way back in, what was it, 2015 when you started that? Yeah, it's 2015 when I uh, started this. Um, I had to take a year off in there because I was working on some classes I had to take for my secular job. Yes, but I'm going to be teaching that. lesson. I'm going to be teaching lesson 208 on Sunday. I um. All right, so we're going to come and we're going to come back to that. So if you have any questions at all. Anything, anything uh, related to the history of the grace movement, the uh, 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 translation preservation, those are his, his big key. So even he's an expert on J.C. O'Hare, E.W. Bollinger. Uh, a lot of my favorite guys, too, like uh, Charles Henry McIntosh and uh, William Kelly. Uh, this guy, I mean, he's, he's, if, if, so this is a great chance if you want to interact with Brian, but I, but I have some shocking news about Brian. I want to, I want to talk about this, this first, this podcast that Brian and Becky did the other day that you, you might find this shocking, but Brian has Brian and Becky and the family have had a really rough couple of months, bunch of a few months. And Brian, uh, not too long ago, actually, uh, was questioning whether he should continue as pastor. And he actually went to the board of his church and asked them, told them about some of the life struggles, shall we say life struggles, uh, that the family's been going through, and asked them if they felt he was still qualified to be pastor. If you can believe that. Um, all right, so uh, set that up for me, Brian. What the the what had actually led to this moment where you were thinking about whether you should continue as pastor. I mean, I fell out of my chair when I heard that. I and I actually replayed the podcast again and had Lori listen with me. Couldn't believe it. Well, so I'll I'll talk in some generalities. There's a few things that are I want to keep private for the sake of my son. Yep. Um, but um, I started noticing. Um, maybe January of 2022 that something was off. Um, I suspected something, I suspected a couple things, but I couldn't really 
I couldn't prove anything. And so I didn't want to make accusations against him uh, on stuff that I couldn't prove. So I just sort of watched, asked him a variety of times, you know, are you into this? Are you into that? You know, what's going on with you? And he, of course, denies everything and says that, you know, everything's fine. And I, I, I know otherwise, just by the behavior, things really started to get intense last August, a year ago, August, and um, some things happened and a lot of stuff the dam sort of broke on what he was doing and what he was into. And then that led to just a really dark period of family struggle with trying to help him, trying to figure out what we were going to do. He was, uh, he was on the verge of turning 18 and he persisted in doing certain things. And, you know, we had to say to him, look, you know, we don't approve of what you're doing. Um, if you want to keep doing these things, uh, after you turn 18, then we're going to, you know, you're going to have to find somewhere else to live um, because we just weren't going to financially support it. We weren't going to like aid and abet it. And of course, um, I could read my Bible and I see in First Timothy 3 about uh, the qualifications of a, of a bishop or an elder in the church. And uh, one of the qualifications is, you know, that he's got to rule well his own house and his children are supposed to be you know, not unruly, et cetera. And so um, over the fall of last year, things just continued to build. And um, I started to question, should I still be doing this? And so I, in a board meeting, I, we had, I called for a closed board meeting and I laid out to the other elders everything that's going on. And I just said to them, I'm like, you know, uh, with you guys knowing this, are you do you think I should continue to uh, serve as the pastor of the church? And mm -hmm. so then that led to, you know, some, some conversation and I got them involved. And then eventually after, and they, of course, they were very supportive. Um, they really came alongside me and my wife and my other younger son to try to, you know, see us, see us through this. Um, and then when he turned 18, he didn't, feel the need to uh, stop what he was doing. And so we, um, he did leave the house and has been living somewhere else for the last six months, pretty close now. Um, his graduation was in doubt. There was a lot of things that were still going on. And uh, eventually I had to tell the church, look, he's not going to be around. Uh, I gave some general statements about why he wouldn't be around. And I was very worried that there would be a lot of judgment and condemnation and uh, so forth, those kinds of concepts related to it. And what I found was just the opposite, that people were very supportive and encouraging, uh, very willing to pray for us, to ask how they might be able to help. Led to a lot of stories of people telling me things about, you know, how they were when they were a young person and the, the struggle that they might have had with their own kids. So, you know, I... I felt like it was a reasonable thing for me to be doubting based upon some of those verses, if I should continue in that capacity. Now, uh, there's there's a lot of uh, a lot of things uh, about that story uh, that I love, and I had a lot of reactions to it. And, I want, uh, and to start with, um, your oldest son. I, I uh, to some degree, I see a lot of myself in that kid. I feel nothing but love and sympathy, you know, because I had my own life struggles. <laughs> I had to get at, be be put out on my own in a similar way, and uh, and it was turned out to be the best thing that happened to me, you know. And uh, and yeah. I had to personally hit bottom for me to realize, you know, this whole I need to reprioritize my life. This direction I'm heading isn't there. Isn't anything. Uh, healthy or good about it. And there's a reason God is important. You know, there's a reason uh, studying his word is important. Being with believers is important. I totally get it now. But I had to learn that on my own because I was just uh, and I grew up in a grace church like he did. Didn't appreciate what I had until I lost it, you know, until I walked away from it. And then I didn't really truly appreciate his grace till I hit bottom and came back because for me, you know, the saints here at this church, I came back, I didn't know what to think. And the saints said, look, you may have walked away from the Lord, but he never walked away from you. And yeah. automatically I already appreciated the grace 
uh, you appreciate his grace even more after having gone through that. And it made me that much more passionate about, you know, the grace life. Yeah, uh, I would so, say he, he's been, you know, you, you evaluate your kids, I guess, on a couple different levels. Um, on a sort of a secular level, if I could say it that way, he did yep. manage to graduate high school. Uh, he just did that late last month, and he is maintaining, you know, yep. a full time job. Great. So, Great. like, I, I'm happy about that stuff. Great. Um, and he's safe. And he's, as far as I know, <laughs> he's yeah. safe. But like, as far as the spiritual side, though, like, um, I'm, I've yet to see any real sort of sensitivity to the things of the Lord or or, or that, yep. and I just keep praying that, you know, that comes around. Um, <sighs> with him so uh, guys like us guys like me man sometimes you just gotta go down that path and realize this is not good i gotta i gotta change course here this is not good at all some guys some guys just have to go through that which is which no father wants to see it's um, hard too when you're a pastor and you're you're living your life out in front of the public eye so if, if you're just a, that's right if you're just a you know a I'll say this word, although I don't like it. If you're just a parishioner at a church and you just attend, you know, you can kind of, you're not, you're not in the forefront of sort of what's going on. Like you are, if you're, you know, the right. pastor and ministering. And then I think you take that and you realize that he had that at church. And then at school, I was a teacher in the school. So like he couldn't really get away from me, I guess. I don't know. But, um, I think there's all of that stuff is kind of what he's used as excuses for, you know, why he's made some of the choices he's made. Yeah. There's a, there's a whole other topic too. And you and I can both relate to this in the sense of it's not easy being a teenager growing up in grace. You know, the grace churches are all small. There's often not a lot of other teenagers. Uh, so you got to go it alone. And if you really care about the message, then you're stuck with, uh, making friends at conferences and doing long distance friendships in some cases, which is not easy. When I was when I was young, I had I mean, I had written correspondences with different people. We would communicate in writing back. That's how old I am. We would communicate with letters back in those days. Man, you're old, Joel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got photos of you. If you watch I know. it. All right. All right. Let's I'll stop. I'll stop. <laughs> I'm totally kidding. <laughs> And you know, it's hard, you know, it's hard. Um, the, uh, you know, so, the, and, and then on top of that, you know, the prospects for a, 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 a spouse in grace is sometimes hard. You know, there's not a lot to choose from. Uh, I made all the wrong choices growing up. Uh, it was, it was a mess and, uh, and it's hard. And then you add on top of that being a pastor's kid, which is a whole other level of scrutiny and attention and, you know, living in the fishbowl for him. And there's a whole other level of expectation also, really. Uh, and and then on top of that, you know, you, 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 you know, I was thinking too, I was talking to Lori the other day about, well, you know, I mean, in the pressures, when, when we were growing up, what, what did, what did, in fact, I asked my dad this yesterday. I said, you know, what, what, what were the things that they, they, you had to worry about when I was growing up? Bad music? Uh, bad movies, bad friends, you know, um, you know, today, what do these kids have? They've got phones and internet and technology and all this other whole other level of corrupting influences on them that we never had growing up. Uh, it's an uphill battle as a parent who can't relate to that, you know, and, um, yeah. It's a it's a different world than when we were kids and the kids are different. You know, I you know, I so I feel nothing but sympathy for that kid. I nothing but love and sympathy for him because I totally I get it. I was there, you know. Yeah, um, you're right, though. Like working in a high school, I see this also from that angle of just just the the general malaise that kids are under. Teenagers are under these days. Um it's it's sad, you know. For most of world history, people didn't know what was happening in the next village over. Now, now because of the internet and social media, like something happens and you get bombarded with it as soon as it happens. And now you now the kids on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, uh, TikTok, and six other you know 
apps and their phones. I collect phones. Um, every hour I have a box and I go to every kid and I said, phones in the box, please. And they turn their phones into the box. And then I take the box and I set it over on the bookshelf. Yeah. That yeah. box buzzes constantly yeah. the whole hour. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> and as a teacher, you know, you can't compete with what's going on on that phone. Right. And the only way for them to have any sort of meaningful learning is to separate them physically from the phone. And they have yeah. anxiety over it, like like legitimate yeah. separation anxiety over my phone is not on my person. It's over there in the box. It's really right. crazy. Right. Robert Bell uh, would tell me uh, one of the uh, uh, which blew my mind. One of the things he has done with some of these kids who are so addicted to their phones He'll take the phone away from him, and but and it's hard to get him to talk. So one of the things he'll take the phone away from, him and then he'll take him outside and take him for a walk. That way, yep. the walking will do give him a little bit of visual stimulation, and they'll they'll start to open up and converse somehow. Somehow, walking helps, uh, and uh, it's unbelievable the way that the phones have completely rewired the brains of of the kids, and so that's a whole other level of trouble and problems that parents have to deal with that never happened when we were young. Yep. I would agree. Uh, so nothing but sympathy there. The other aspect too, and you know, I was talking, um, well, actually I had to take my dad to the doctor. He's actually doing better after his, his cancer surgery. And, um, we were talking, you know, this whole aspect of first Timothy three, you know, the bishop's got to rule his house. Well, the kids need to be in subjection. Is it still crackling? It's Every still so humor. often. Huh? Every so often, yeah. All right. Um, I might I might give you a look. We were we were thinking that I don't know if you know those verses necessarily means that the kids of the pastors and the bishops have to grow up to be perfect human beings. Um they um you know, you have to just rule the house well. While they're growing up, they just need to be in subjection. There needs to be a seriousness about it. Okay, now I'm having all kinds of issues here. Hang on. Uh, okay, let me, let me, I'm going to, hang on. You want me to take over the podcast? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right, speak to, um, okay, so for me, uh, all right, r and real quick, for me, the um, I don't think I think you just have to rule the house well. It doesn't necessarily mean that the kids have to grow up to be perfect. And I think there is, uh, you know, the decisions that you and Becky have had to make in the last few months only demonstrate that you've been ruling your house well, I think. Uh, I'm not sure you really needed to get and I'm sure it was probably a healthy thing just to talk to the board about it and there being awareness of it and allowing them. But I'm not so sure that there was anything um, that has happened in the last couple of years that would demonstrate that you have not been ruling your house. Well, I know that I know those kids know you love them. I know they know the right and wrong. They're at that at that age, you know. Uh, so well, we we've, we've certainly tried to, you know do what the scriptures say and raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and to teach them the truth. Um, and you are right. It's particularly my older one, you know, he's s in a cultural sense coming of age and turning 18 and, you know, can be an adult. Although I dispute that the arbitrary age of 18 is what makes somebody an adult. But I think though that it's easy for some, the reason I felt that I needed to go to the board is it's easy for me in the privacy of my own situation with my wife and family to just justify my action, justify everything right. as, as, you know, okay or acceptable. And I think it's important that there was a check of other believers particularly yep. elders in the assembly. And for me to say, look, here's what's going on. You know, and I, they said something similar to what you said, you know, the very fact that you're even coming to us with this and telling us tells us that you, you are endeavoring, you know, sure. to rule well your own house. Um, that was part of their response. And just generally about first Timothy three, I mean, I agree with you. I'm going to say something. I don't mean to be irreverent, but I'm going to make a, illustration I, I, i'm wrong all the time ask anybody so it's okay you're always welcome to give me pushback about anything brother 
I, I, I just, I think, you ever seen the movie Pirates of the Caribbean? Oh, you would bring up a Disney uh, movie. Yeah, really? I'm sorry. It's it's, it's back to Disney. <laughs> yeah, but anyway. Yeah, so I saw anyway, the first one. Yeah. Well, that's all you need to have seen. In the first one, there's the quote, <laughs> pirate, there's the pirate code. Yep. And they call a parlay. And so, like, yep. and then they say, well, the code is really more like guidelines than rules. <laughs> and that's right. I, that's, yep. that's kind of the way I view this list here in First Timothy 3. Like, totally if you want to be... Lee, if you want to be to the letter of this, then no one is going to be qualified to be an elder in a church. Right, right. So I, I view it more as here's here's the general categories that you need to be concerned with um, for being an elder in a church. Um, one of which is, though, the idea of, you know, if you can't rule well your own house, how are you going to rule well the church of God's concept? And so when I started having... And I got into, a, I don't want to say I was depressed. That might be too strong, but I was seriously struggling to go to church, teach the Bible and feeling like I should continue to do that, knowing what was happening, you know, uh, at home. Mm -hmm. So I, um, the, uh, um, yeah. So, what are your thoughts? Anybody out there, you have any thoughts about uh, what Brian and uh, Becky have been going through? I'd love to hear it. I think um, I think it's actually a very good discussion to have. Um, I know uh, there was um, some discussion with you and Becky on that pod on the latest podcast you had about mental health, and um, uh, and you know, I, for me. And I know not everybody is wired like I am, and everybody, and for everybody, the situation is different. I had terrible mental health. I my depression was awful, and uh, which is why I was drinking so badly. And that and that depression was cured by literally cured by identification. Once I learned that, wrapped my head around that, studied that in scripture, that just. I don't know. The light went off, and I I felt enormous peace inside of myself, but. After you've been living with it for a long time and you go through those usual struggles in life, um, you know, one of the things that uh, Hal and I were talking about, you know, was just that, you know, there are when you're going through struggles in life, there's nothing wrong with feeling it. You know, just because you've, you've got that doctrine in you doesn't necessarily mean that no matter what happens, you're always going to have that foundation of joy and peace in your life. You're, you're going to feel those stresses and those struggles. And you're going to when something bad happens, you're going to feel sad about it. Paul certainly felt that way. How I remember when his when his when Kathy died, he, he called up once and he was just like, I've got all this doctrine in me and I don't know. But I feel like my soul has been ripped in two. I don't know how to, you know, I don't know what to, how to, how I'm going to get through that, you know, and it was just, hey, look, it's perfectly normal to feel that way. Perfectly normal to go through all those emotions. It's not, there's, it is something you should embrace and allow yourself to go through while you're struggling. And then you will, the sound doctrine is just a foundation of joy. It's no guarantee that you won't be feeling sad about things that happen in life. Do you have any thoughts about that, Pastor? What's your reaction to that? Uh, my Christ is in you, but the world comes at you. And the world comes at us all the time. All you know, the the we're constantly being bombarded by worldly thinking, you know, all this stuff, and including in your family. And it's only natural, I think. God, yeah, you're you you're completely identified with Christ. Your old man is dead, as you say, D E A D dead. <laughs> uh, he's dead, and you're a new creature in Christ, and all that is true. But bad stuff's still gonna happen to you. Circumstantial right. things are gonna come your way. You're gonna lose loved ones, you're gonna have tragic right. things happen. There's gonna be terrible things maybe you're dealing with in the with the saints in the assembly at church, which I'm thankful I'm not currently, but like all of that stuff is emotional. And I, I think the emotional stuff. So in, 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 uh, in, uh, first Corinthians, second Corinthians chapter 11, Paul goes through that whole list of all the physical stuff that happened to him, right? Shipwreck, the beating, you know, uh, being naked and starving and, 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 yeah. and, and then he gets to the end of it and he says, and beyond all that, the daily right. care of the churches. Right. And, 
I think it's the emotional side of it that is the hardest to deal with. Like I can deal with somebody, you know, um, attacking me physically. You know, I don't want to be attacked physically, but like it's the emotional weight of the ministry that I think is where it gets very hard sometimes. And pastors, and I'll add pastors a a lot of times end up suffering in silence with some of that stuff because they don't feel like they, they, they can talk to anybody about it. Yeah. Because, yeah. um, and that's, that's just, that's a truth. And that's a fact in my yeah. opinion. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I think, uh, pastors it's, it is, there's an emotional aspect to it because, but Paul's pretty clear in, especially in the pastoral epistles, you need to be a model of love and charity. You need to be an example of it. You need to demonstrate it to the people, despite, regardless of how they treat you, <laughs> what they say to you, what they do to you, you've got to be a model of first Corinthians 13. You've got to, you've got to model that, you know, and that's hard. And, and, and it's exhausting. And that, and that ends up meaning that a lot of times you have to eat stuff, eat yeah, your right. emotions, stuff them down, you know, trying to, show grace and charity to people uh sometimes when like you're at you're at the end of the rope man yourself and um especially with what happened in with covid um covid was excessively hard on me and our oh, ministry here oh um, yeah oh yeah so like it's just i i i don't i think that you can be you can understand your identification you know who you are in christ you know you're complete in Christ. You know you're a new creature in Christ. And that's the foundation out of which you should right. live your life. But that's not going to stop the stuff from coming at you. That's and, right. And, and nor are you going to be, it's going to keep you from being upset and sad and, you know, worried about a kid you love that's right. uh, just making choices, is having life struggles. That's not going to change that. Um, and that's perfectly natural part of part of life, I think. And uh, I think the Lord, you know, you, we, we can still grieve the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit's a member of the Godhead. He can still grieve. You know, there's that emotional aspect. But, in, you know, with my mother uh, having passed uh, last month, that was hard, you know. And, uh, and I, you know, we all grieved, but it, there was a foundation of peace to it all because I knew where she was and was very happy for her, kind of jealous in some respects. It was that foundation of peace, but we still grieved, you know, like right. any normal family would. Yeah. Um, and, and and the other aspect of ministry that Hal continually warns me about, well, not continually, but he he sometimes talks about Doug Dodd, and Doug Dodd extended himself too much to he was just he couldn't say no to anybody or anything you know he was doing so much all day all night that he was burning the candles at both ends. And there were times when Hal would grab him and literally drag him away from the ministry and take him on a trip somewhere, you know. And Hal was always concerned about Doug's uh, weariness and well-doing, you know. And it is possible to overextend yourself in the ministry and be emotionally and just intellectually spent to such a degree that you just the burn is hard, you know. Um, and, uh, I, so Hal's reminder to me was always, you better make sure, you know, you better take your breaks. You better get out every once in a while. You need to, you know, uh, because between writing books and prepping for podcasts and doing sermons and do all this other stuff we're doing behind the scenes, you know, it's easy to get burned out and, uh, pastors, you know, and I think one of the aspects of being a pastor, you got to be not, not be afraid to say no. That's what I learned from Doug Dodd. You know? I totally agree with that. I totally agree with that. And, you know, I, I try to be upfront with our saints, especially, you know, I'm working a whole nother job. Uh, you know, I it's nine months out of the year, but when I'm in those nine months, it's a lot. Um, I've yeah. got to teach five days a week. I've got to, like, I don't, I, I literally, and I'm not saying this to complain. It's just a fact. No. I don't get a day off. Yeah. Um, so when Christmas break rolls around from school or spring break or summer break, I'm like, you right. Know, I, I, I truly try to take advantage of those times to step away from some of the teaching responsibility, give myself a break, um, you know, those kinds of things, because and, and take and take vacations with my family that are non ministry vacations. Right. 
Um, I I don't a, a conference for a pastor. It's nice to get away to see other people, to network with other believers, to have fellowship, etc. But if you're at that conference and you're speaking, right, it's not really a break for you, right? Uh, it, because right. you're still on, so right. to speak. Right, right. Uh, and the, uh, um, uh, uh, oh, I had a brilliant point I was going to make. The thing was just brilliant, and it's just totally escaped me. <laughs> <laughs> Lori's laughing in the back there. I had I had a brilliant point I was going to make. I can't remember what it was. All right. Uh, so uh, long story short, I, I loved this. Uh, so Brian and Becky uh, post, there's a link beneath the video. I've got links to all kinds of Brian Ross goodies. Uh, one of which is the latest podcast that Brian and Becky put out. And so if you want to know more details and hear uh, a lot of these struggles that they went through, including from Becky's perspective, which is always interesting. Uh, and uh, so check that out. Check out that podcast. If you guys have any uh, comments or questions about that, I'd love to hear it. Um, and, uh, you know, nothing but love for that kid, too. And nothing but love for you and Becky and what you guys are, are going through. Um, having said all of that, this is the Grace Life Podcast, and we are your mad, bad brothers in Christ. Mad in the sense of mid axe dispensational, bad in the sense of blessed and delivered. I'm some guy named Joel. This, this guy I have here with me, the eminent, the man, the myth, the legend, Pastor Brian Ross. I mean, this guy, you know, Grace History Project. Uh, from this generation forever, all these books, the King James Bible in America, all this stuff, this stuff I love. I got Brian Ross with me. So if you have any questions, I'd love to hear it. Uh, we, uh, uh, While the world is careening down Route 666, we've got our In Christ passports for Flight 777 of Titus 213 Airlines ready to take off at a moment's notice. We're watching the countdown to the showdown of Armageddon, and we're going to party like it's Revelation 19.9. Hey, we got a bunch of links beneath the video, including a link to this thing here, Empowered by His Grace. You got to buy this book. I'm desperate to outsell Brian Ross. That's all, <laughs> that's all I live to do. Uh, but this is all about identification, which we mentioned earlier. All about what God made you in Christ. Romans 6, dead, buried, risen with Him. The old man, D-E-A-D, dead, as Bob Picard would say, and you literally being freed from the power and the bondage of sin. Check that book out. We've also got, I've got other books I'm going to promote today, too. Uh, we've also got a link beneath the video to a page on our website where you could financially support us. And uh, if the, if the, you can support us through, if, so if you appreciate the ministry, these pastors, everybody coming out and joining us. And having fellowship, it does take money to keep all this rolling. So any help you could offer to support the ministry would be greatly, greatly appreciated. Um, we also have, um, I, I've, I've got all kinds of uh, Brian Ross goodies. And let's just promote Brian here for a minute. I've got, let me see here. Uh, this is his YouTube channel, Grace Life Bible. You like Des Stridum. You Des is like Grace Way, one word. <laughs> is, is that grace live a one word thing too i mean you write books no, right <laughs> no I, it was actually i had a, a a volunteer set that up for me oh okay year, years ago and that's all the right. way they did it so all right all right very I good i just never changed it um and brian brian's just i mean the thing is epic uh, these are all of his latest videos. You had a video you posted an hour ago. I didn't get a chance to hear it, but we're going to talk about is if we get a chance, we're going to get to the dispensationalism book too. Cause I got questions about that. Um, live streaming. Uh, it's just awesome. And then over here we have the, uh, this is, he has the complete playlist from this generation forever. A couple hundred 200 and what, three videos now, something like that? It'll be, it'll be 208 Sunday. 208 and Sunday. I'm up yeah. around 197, 98, something like that. I got to get caught up on the on all the preface stuff. Uh, can't, can't wait to get into that. So from this generation forever, when he started this back in 2015, I'm sitting – you started this and I started it with you, man. I was sitting on my back patio with a stogie. Getting uh, seeing you start this new series, and I thought, you know what? For the first time in my life, 
I'm going to I'm going to listen to this and try to see if I can understand the whole King James translation, the history of it. That that would be pretty awesome. So I've been hanging with you for literally five years now. Well, no, longer than that. Fifteen. So, yeah, that's just so it's just an amazing series he's done. Uh, here is his channel on Rumble. Awesome. I'm a follower on that. We're uh, there's his website. Look at that. Look at the oh, look at the ladies there. Isn't that awesome? By love, serve one another. You should have the kiss one in there. Hey, you see that? That's Becky uh, singing there. Uh, I love that church building too. Um, he's got all kinds of good stuff here on his website. Also, you've got uh, the Gospels Project, the Grace History Project, which is you know arguably the thing that uh, really made Brian hugely popular. His him coming to just going through the history of the entire grace movement, which is kind of a long history, uh, going all the way back to Paul, pretty much. Um, the uh, from this generation forever. Uh, so uh, he has his own Grace Life School of Theology online, which is awesome. Uh, and then the Grace Life Press here. How awesome is that? Don't pass over Easter. Uh, I was, uh, I don't know if I ever told you, I, you actually changed my mind on Easter after I read that book. Uh, All right. Yeah. I just yeah. did an interview on that yesterday on uh, Dwayne Green's YouTube channel. Oh, yeah. I like him. I like him. Yeah, I yeah, like Dwayne. He's awesome. A, he's and I like guy. the conversations you have with him because I am so not uh, schooled enough to have that kind of an in-depth conversation. I think that what you're doing with him is fantastic. Thanks. From this generation forever, I read. I've read everything he he has on this uh, on this page here. They're all great, They're all great. And then over here, the Just Grace of Podcast. So I have links to all of this stuff um, uh, on uh, right beneath the video. So check it all out, my brother Brian Ross. So here's another question, Becky. She's working at your school now. You get to see Becky every day at school, right? I mean, what's that like? You've got, does she come and do you guys go have lunch together now? I mean, how does that Sometimes. work? Um, so <laughs> she's working with a, a individual student that has a traumatic brain injury. Um, I would say we have lunch together maybe once a week. Um, it just sort of depends on what's going on uh, for her in the building on a given day. And then like what's going on for me on a given day. But um, yeah, I do see her at work. Um, kids have figured out that she's my wife. So <laughs> now, they're, now they're like, you know, it's just teens being stupid, but um, uh, yeah, so it's, it's good. I, uh, I, I'm, I encouraged her when the job came open, Last fall, I encouraged her to, to consider taking it because I thought she'd be really good. Oh, um, yeah. Help to this girl. And um, I would say with I don't think I'm being too um, biased. I think that the girl succeeded uh, with my wife's uh, due largely to my wife's help. I believe it. I believe it. I can't imagine a better person for that poor girl uh, than, than Becky. Uh, and Becky, uh, I remember she said that she has a, um, uh, she got a scholarship and now she's going to be studying uh, what uh, mental health and how to cancel um, counsel um, more people like what she just did. So she, she has received a free scholarship to be a certified mental health coach. Um, it's through Liberty university um, and she's been very interested in this topic ever since, you know, five, six years ago when we really got into like the renewing of the mind and how the brain right. plays a role in that and so forth. So, um, she's, she's excited and, um, you know, hopefully that's something she could maybe not only use for people in our church, but also, you know, maybe she'll have a career after her work in the school doing something different with that but that's all yeah. maybe it's at the moment yeah no that's awesome and i you know uh, a lot of that I, I i remember a lot of those uh videos you had on the mind uh, i listened to all of those i thought those were fantastic and i remember uh you know when i i, I uh, so i had i hit bottom july 2014 
uh, like a week later, I was in Fellowship Bible Church <laughs> and uh, I, I had uh, and I mean, I was I remember Paul's your apostle. I still remember the gospel, you know, uh, death, burial and resurrection payment for sins. I remember that. I remember sealed by the spirit, but I probably couldn't have told you where it was. I knew I had eternal security. That was about it. That was about it. So, I mean, I was I came I came and I started hitting the word basically from scratch all over again and uh, started in Romans. And um, and the point and one of the things I learned after I learned about identification was uh, where's your mind? That was what I kept telling myself a lot of times because my mind would go off in a direction and what it in, 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 you know, in the when I was depressed and I was just obsessing about things going on in the world, you know, and my mind would go in that direction. And I'd say, where's your mind? What are you thinking about? And then steer your thoughts back over to scripture and identification and quote verses to yourself and meditate on those verses. And that always fixed me. You know, I used to have these uh, mental rages uh, I would go through. I mean, just somebody would do me wrong somewhere and I would just have I would never act on it. But I had a mental rage. And after I came back to church, I had to uh, you know, it was I, I was I was trying to. They started to slow down and they were less frequent than they used to be. But every once in a while, something ugly would happen to me and I'd be like, oh, and uh, and I'd go into this mental rage and I would quote Ephesians 432 to myself, you know, be yeah. kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Right. And the, and, and the thing about that verse was not that I need to be tender and forgiving. The thing about that verse that always got me was as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. You remember how stupid you were, Joel? Do you remember the dumb things you did and God forgave you? You know, that to, verse to me was convicting more than <laughs> guiding because yeah. I was all this thing I'm raging about was something stupid somebody else did was no better and no worse than the dumb stuff I've done that offended God, you know? And uh, so that that's what fixed me. But my my mantra uh, uh, for my own mental health was always, where's your mind? Where's your mind, Joel? What are you thinking? You know, and then I'd have to quote verse to myself and get myself back on the right path. So every once in a while that that still happens and I've got to steer my thinking. But um, uh, all the stuff that you guys you had taught about mind enormously helpful to me. Another reason I just I love you guys to death. Um I have another question for you, Brian. Okay. Did you turn your van into a tripod? What? <laughs> with just three wheels? You know, do you, you did you turn your car into a tripod with just three wheels, or did you put the fourth wheel back on your on your van? After April, your trip to Shorewood. Oh my goodness. <laughs> 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 yeah, first of <laughs> first of all, that was my Nissan, not my, uh, not my van, but man, oh, that was, oh, it's funny in my I've head had, with the van instead of the Nissan, man, I, I've <laughs> had some nightmares, honestly, about all that. Oh man. The poor guy, he drives into Shorewood and his tire comes off. His tire comes off. His tire comes off the car. <laughs> I was just couldn't believe it. So like the, to, just quickly, the rest of the story, I knew, I was going to be going to Chicago at the end of the week. So I made an appointment with a garage to have my oil changed and my tires rotated and I just normal maintenance type stuff. And they called me and they said, well, and my car has about a hundred thousand on it now. So I was expecting there might be something that, you know, needed to attention or what have you. So they called me and they said, well, you need a, um, you need a new, uh, wheel bearing, not a wheel bearing. Um, I forgot what it was. Something on CV the, joint? what's that? CV joint, maybe? No, it wasn't a CV joint. It was something with the, um, it's something with a wheel bearing, I think. But anyway, so they, I'm like, yeah, go ahead, do it. So um, I have the bolt right here. They put this, <laughs> <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is my <laughs> memento. So they oh, inserted this, they inserted this, and they never tightened it. Yeah. So yeah. I drove all the way from I drove around all the way, all the way from Michigan to Chicago with this bolt in the in the repair without it being tight. Like I'm lucky we didn't die. 
And yeah, I turn into the parking lot at Shorewood, and it the tire just goes boonk. And I'm like, what's going on? Then Ben Wanda found the bolt on his driveway at his house in no. Chicago. <laughs> and I, I had lost the bolt in his driveway and still drove all the way to the church. Unbelievable. Yeah, it's pretty Unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. So yeah, needless to say, I went back to the garage, and I'm like, you see this bolt? <laughs> you need to give me my money back and pay That's for right. my towing and the repair and realign my front end and yeah. they did everything without yeah. charging me because like that was a major uh, lawsuit probably waiting to happen for them uh yeah uh, there's a comedian ron white who uh, i used to listen to when i was away from the lord and he has a whole thing about him going to sears and uh, the uh, tire, he's driving away and the tire actually fell off his van. And uh, he's, he's going to talk about this story with Sears uh, until the lawsuit is settled. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, the guy who worked on his van, the guy that, you know, he spent three days going to tire school. He's like, well, I guess he must have called in sick on lug nut day. <laughs> it's unbelievable, though. Like, oh, oh I know. It's like you can't get – it's like our whole country and economy has, like, just forgotten how to do anything. Oh, um, they've lost their minds, it seems like. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. We've had a, yeah. We've had and a, usually, yeah, most we, place, usually most places will have a guy that will come to your car and check and make sure all the work was done before they give it back, you know? Yeah. Weird. Cra uh, unbelievable. Okay, so I got to do uh, Damon 10 here. Damon Tin says, good morning, saints, and to our mad, bad, precious brothers of the mutual faith, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, and a big welcome to Brother Brian Ross. Grace and peace to you all. Um, the uh, uh, Lots of love coming out to you. John Snodgrass somewhere says, I love Brian's voice. <laughs> <laughs> Larry and Colin, good to see you. Just have to say, Brother Brian, I am loving the Galatians study. Always love the passion you bring as a teacher. Well, thank you. Uh, I was told I did not get to hear last Sunday. I've had a lot going on, and I was told that you did a big old identification uh, sermon. That's yeah, awesome. I definitely got into identification. Um, I love that picture of Joel and Brian. It's hilarious. Yeah. I really miss that church. Uh, he's got the, uh, you know, greet one another with a holy kiss, which he believes, but he's not, not about to not about to practice in today's world. Yep. Um, oh, Bob Picard's in the house here, too. Uh, what, do we, uh, what else do we have here? Oh, Bob says, uh, I had thought that I ordered the Rise and Fall of Dispensationalism as a, a pre-pub offer through Logos, but I didn't. Um we're going to talk about that soon. We're going to talk about that soon. David told me that if the book has the word dispensational or dispensationalism in the title, Brian's going to read it and he's going to do videos on it. David Reed um, said that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that might be true. Um, let me see here. There was Persis was in there. I wanted to see. Per yeah. She says, good morning, pastors and saints. My son at age 15 decided drinking would be fun. I gave him a choice to live in my home or elsewhere. He chose elsewhere. Decades later, he remains the uh, delightful man he was then and more alcohol-free. Praise the Lord. Yep. Yeah, good Good to hear stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I've heard a lot of stories like that. A lot of stories. Yeah. I think a lot of people, uh, a lot of the, um, a lot of people uh, react to me in a similar way because seeing me turn myself around, uh, gives them hope about some of their own relatives and kids, I think. Um, yeah. And um, it's always possible. It's always possible. Persis says, loved your podcast and mid midweek lessons. Yeah. Yeah, Thank they're you. great. They are legitimately great. I love that house, too. I've been in that room. Brian's sitting in. Uh, the office. It looks, like the, it, lo the, it looks like a kind of a normal, a regular room, but that thing's a broom closet. Uh, it's, uh, I couldn't believe how small it was. I thought it was a big old room. I thought, you know, I don't know what I was imagining. What are all those books you got behind you? Have you actually read every single book you have sitting behind you on this, on those, on that bookshelf? Is my wife listening? <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say not cover to cover, but I have 
use them all for something, which is yep. why I have them. Do you, uh, when you read, are you slow or do you speed read or do you skim some some books? How, how are you in reading? Because uh, I go at different speeds depending upon what the book is. Yeah, so um, I have different strategies I use when I read depending on what I'm reading. Um, one of the th one of the things that is huge for me is what I call footnote mining which is a, a little bit of a slow process. So if I'm reading a book and a guy says he makes an assertion, I go to the footnote and I'm like, okay, where did he get this from? And then I go and try and find that. Yeah. So I have accumulated a huge Dropbox file of yeah. PDF documents uh, from just stuff that I have categorized. And then I can search the documents to find stuff. Yeah. Um, but I tend to read... I tend to, if I'm deciding if I'm going to buy a book, I read the forward, the introduction. I read the, I look at the table of contents. I read the epilogue or the conclusion. And then I look at what books did they use to write the book. And then I decide, do I need to have this book or not? Yeah. Do you, um, uh, uh, do you have any digital books? Do you use Kindle or anything like that? So I have a Kindle. I don't. I don't typically use it that much. Um, there's a few things I've read on it, but I'd still, I guess I'm old school. I still like to have the book in my hands or if I have an electronic book, a PDF, I have it for the search function mm. to find what I need right away. I love Kindle because uh, like I went through, um, I've been studying uh, the kingdom and I went through Dwight Pentecost things to come again and uh, you can copy and paste stuff. And it'll and when you and when you paste it in Word, you automatically get the 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 reference, uh, you know, the page number, the proper reference to uh, where that quote comes from. I'm like, that's just awesome. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I do I, on some things. I do love Kindle. I have like um, like Baxter's Explore the Book and Kindle and stuff. When there's something, somebody I want to quote in a sermon, and I want to have that reference handy. Oh, that's that's just nice, easy copy paste thing. Um, the other thing people don't realize is every book you own is a um, index for the internet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can put in quotes anything you want and search the entire World Wide Web and find stuff. Yeah, um, it's amazing. That's so like the internet. The, the internet is like this really evil, dangerous place, but it's also really brilliant for people who are using it for actual, real, legitimate research. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Chiita says, uh, we had to do the same with our son, Benny. He left home a day before he turned 18. Now he is, he is now 20, but we are on good terms now. He still lives away from home. Yesterday he came to visit. Nice. Um, John Snodgrass says, I left home when I was 18 and didn't say a word. Uh, worried mom and dad bad. I was no stranger to right and wrong. Hard headed. Yep. Yeah. Um, Uh, Amy Stewart says, maybe I could be labeled a fangirl. Yeah. Um, uh, Bob Picard says, it's so important to be as transparent as possible with the congregation. They need to understand that we are all fleshly uh, humans who err. Totally agree with that. You know, Lori had, you know, when I, I, I was kind of blown away when you said that you were going to go visit, when you had visited your board and Lori um, had told me that she says not only she was hugely impressed with your church and the, in the way that they responded to you, she said, that's, that's the way a church should respond to a pastor uh, in those having that kind of circumstance. And, but that's, that's not always the case with a lot of churches, not maybe not, but some churches are like, well, you've got a kid that's having life struggles and therefore this kid is being a bad influence on my kid. And I, you know, this, you can't, I'm going to go, or you can't be pastor or something like that going on. Yeah. Uh, and uh, your church uh, just responded not only properly, but in grace and love in a way that was just so, so amazing to hear. I really love that story. Yeah, it was, like I said, in the podcast and earlier in the, it, in this conversation, I wasn't sure what to expect. And I, and I found out that, you know, if you're honest 
the majority of the people in the body of Christ are more than willing to bear one another's burdens and, you know, do what the scriptures say. Um, so that, that was, that's been great. Um, Lourdes is making claim to Pirates in the Caribbean, being made in Puerto Rico. Uh, we got Carl Coates in the house. How you doing, Beard Brother? Great to see you. What's up, Carl? Hey, hey I booked, we booked uh, yesterday, the other day we booked um, flights and um, hotel, and we're going to be uh, we're going to be in Chicago in uh, in July. Oh, uh, cool! We'll be, there, we'll be there from Sunday to Thursday. I'm very excited about that, and yeah, I'm you'll very have a good time. That I can just sit back and listen to you guys and not have to <laughs> be on. <laughs> there you go. It's true. <laughs> yep. Except um, you're going to want to like do a live stream from the conference, probably, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm away. I'm away. <laughs> All uh, right, there you go. That's the right way to do it. Is your dad going to be there? That's really all I care about. Yeah, he'll be there. I'm pretty <laughs> I sure. I wrap there. my arms around that guy. I can't wait to see him. I can't wait to see the guys. I'm really excited about that. Um, there was a there was a comment here that I wanted to get to, and then we're going to move on to the next topic here. Uh, Sandy Briggs says uh, Joel is right on the grief situation. So right, you must go through it. Don't suppress. You will have yeah. to walk through it sooner or later. I know I'm living it. Um, yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, that was the thing with Hal was when he lost Kathy was that you got to go through the process. You know, you got to go through the process. And there's nothing wrong with that process. It's a perfectly natural thing to go through. So go through it. It's OK. Right. It's OK to feel that way. It's OK. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with you personally if you're sad about something going on in your in your life or about your family or you're concerned about somebody that's perfectly natural you know uh there but you just you've just have that foundation of peace and joy and gratitude in your life that helps you endure um yeah. and um but so yeah that was that was a learning curve for me also i when i came back to church i thought well it's expected of me to be happy all the time it's okay to be sad there's nothing wrong with you if you are um, Bob said, uh, being transparent with everyone was the reason we did not have a church split at the beginning of the year, something that was, uh, fomenting under the surface, uh, when I was out. No kidding. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Bob Picard, you know, the, the, when Bob, he kind of came into grace on his own. And the thing that, you know, really kept that church together was Bob. He knew, not only did he know, right division, but he knew identification. And that was the thing everybody loved about what Bob was teaching with this new grace doctrine thing that's going on in his church building. And uh, so I love, I love Bob. Um, uh, um, and I love, uh, I love how the people have embraced identification in that church. Uh, Amy Stewart says it's easy for parents to beat themselves up for the poor choices their children make. Yep. I mean, I made that comment to Brian the other day. I'm like, you know, when I made my bad choices, I never once blamed my parents. And frankly, I can't think of anything my parents did that was wrong. I can't think of anything they did that where I would say, well, it's mom and dad. They didn't love me enough or they didn't do. No. Or they didn't give me any guidance, spiritual guidance. No, can't say that either. There was nothing about my parents. I could I could yeah, think Amy's, Amy's right. I, Amy's by the way, Amy's a great saint here at our assembly. Um but I, she's right. You know, you do beat yourself up over s stupid stuff your kids do. Yeah, I'm the I'm the king of that. Do you do that with yourself? Do you ever beat? I don't. I I, I beat myself up over every every little thing. Uh, I pretty much hate every sermon I do. The podcast, I try not to think about it, or I'd beat myself up. Um, I don't. I mean, not really. I will Good. listen to. Uh, myself to see if I said something the way I wanted to say it, but I don't really dwell on it. Uh, Jay Peeler quoting the first two verses of Colossians 3. Uh, Amy Stewart says, We believers are the children of God. Imagine his heart when we are not living the blessed life he has given us in Christ. Amen. Amen. Um, is there anything else here? Um, all right, so This Generation Forever, the epic book. Let me see if I can get over here and uh, 
It's this book here. I just read it. This one, this generation forever. Um, now these are what what I these are the first. Th these are all the sermons you did for Sunday school. Uh, that first year you started this. Uh, you start you started that series, right? So what? Maybe yeah, the first yes. Twenty or so. The uh, first twenty-seven lesson, lessons. Twenty-seven lessons. Okay. All right. Because yeah. I remember uh, back in the early days, my favorite of all the, I still remember my favorite lesson. And that was, I think it was the one where you went through um, Jeremiah 36 and Jehoiakim when Jehoiakim burned the manuscript. That oh, yeah, was, my okay. that was, that was one of my favorite early studies that you did. I couldn't believe that story. I actually played that message two or three times. I couldn't believe Jehoiakim And here. So is I'm guessing then that lesson 29 would be in the volume two. Is that right? Would that be right? Yeah, volume two, which hopefully will be printed any time now. I'm waiting to hear from Randy on that. Um, Excellent. But volume two is going to cover the second term. Volume one, the one that you have on the screen there, uh, is the first term. So this was September 2015 through June uh, 2016. And then, but volume two, early in volume two, is where I cover the, I use Jeremiah. 36 as a case study for preservation. All right. So I'm going to start since I know that there's a lot of uh, new people that listen. We've got a lot of new listeners out in India and Indonesia now. So I'm going to start with the, with the very basics here. If you have somebody who is just, maybe they're just coming into grace and they're sort of interested in learning about, the King James and translations and preservation. Uh, what would what would be your recommendations for them as to how they should go about studying that topic? The, so, I sometimes I look at the class. Amy Stewart, who's uh, I think still here, is is sitting there physically and has been since 2018 when they started to attend the church. And sometimes, and my dad is always saying, "Who cares about this stuff?" Um, <laughs> really, I it, it was eye opening to me after after you started this class. Uh, I was with you on that, and then I at some point at, in the, after that first uh, season you did, I decided to sit down and read uh, manuscript evidence, the, uh, the PDFs on that, and uh, yeah, so that. and so I, I mean, I found that you you made it interesting to me. So my my reason for saying all that is to say that like this is this is a, such a core issue that gets to the heart of like what is the Bible, how did we get the Bible, and how do we know that the Bible that we're using is reliable or not? Right. And there's so much stuff like uh, I have a whole wall. It's off camera here of stuff, the books that have been written just on this issue of what theologians call bibliology or your doctrine of the bible inspiration preservation you know etc um so there's a lot of rabbit holes that somebody could go down and immediately get either what i would consider not good information or lost in the weeds um i i mean the reason i decided to put these in a book form is because I wanted the class to have legs beyond just the videos. And this volume one on inspiration lays out, in my opinion, like a biblical scriptural defense mm. of the doctrine of inspiration and why inspiration matters to the question of not only, obviously, preservation, but Bible translation in general. Now, uh, if if this topic were to come up, I you know we have basically we keep it pretty high level for the most part. We've got to just sort of do a, uh, answers in a sound bite, maybe something that'll last 30, 60 seconds, and, uh, and then we move on to the next question. Uh, but I would recommend. I mean, if somebody's starting out, I would certainly recommend manu get it, reading the PDFs of manuscript evidence, uh, and then and then I would just say go to Brian. You know, go watch the from this generation forever. It's addictive. <laughs> There's something about history that if I don't know how it is that you make it interesting. 
I don't know. It's like you find the drama of something and you go right to it. And you, it's just always interesting when you teach it. Uh, and uh, you go through the whole history or read uh, the uh, first volume of This Generation Forever. Um, or just read the PDFs from the series. I like I uh, I prefer reading than I do listening to messages. You know, um, so I prefer I love to read your notes more so than than listening. And um, I, you know, you had also mentioned I think in your in your book that you recommend. I think you liked the books of David Norton. Would you still recommend those? I mean, I. David Norton, for anybody who uh, wants to really know about contemporary issues related to the King James Bible, I mean, they have to read David Norton. But you have to understand David Norton is not necessarily a King James advocate per se. He's a King James historian. Right. So he's going to say some stuff that, you know, you're going to have to sort of filter out. But as far as the history he presents the documentation he presents and all of that, like, yeah, I, he's, he's definitely, but he's, you know, he's not easy reading either. Um, He's, he's a scholar. He's a historian, a literary, literary scholar who's written copiously on this topic. But yeah, if you're, if you're going to pay attention to the subject matter, you've got to read Norton. The other guy you have to read who is, working on a multi-year project right now is Dr. Lawrence Vance from Florida, who's working on a, a, a book called the text of the King James Bible, where he just lays out the massive amounts of history. So like what I'm trying to do is read all that stuff and filter all that stuff down so that on the popular level, more people can sort of digest it. What um, you had mentioned, I think, uh, that, you know, some people, when they do a deep dive on this topic of translations and preservation and stuff, uh, some in some cases they become KJV only. And then your book had cited another case. I think it was this Bart. Airman. Airman. Yeah. Moody Bible guy who uh, became an agnostic. Yeah. Uh, you know, so it, how is it that somebody could do a deep dive on this whole thing and become an agnostic? Well, what I argue, and I, I don't think I'm arguing out of turn either, because I have his book over here, uh, Misquoting Jesus, where he goes through his own personal history, how he got saved. He went to Moody Bible Institute. Um, he was taught the prevailing position on the Bible that was that has that holds sway in the evangelical world of our day um, that doesn't teach the doctrine of preservation. They teach inspiration, but they don't teach the doctrine of preservation. Uh, I've got theology books on the shelf behind me where when you go to their section on bibliology, they don't they say nothing about the doctrine of preservation. Mm -hmm. So Airman then he goes to Wheaton College for his graduate work and he ends up with uh, Bruce Metzger at Princeton Theological Seminary. And throughout that entire swath of his education, whether it's Moody, Wheaton, or wherever, he's never taught the doctrine of preservation. Mm. And so he gets to Princeton Theological Seminary. He encounters a textual variant that he doesn't know what to do with. Right. And so what ends up happening is his faith is basically rocked to the core Right. And he says, well, if God didn't preserve his word, why should I believe that he even inspired exactly. it in the first place? Right. And so he ends up a total agnostic, right. um, doubting and questioning, you know, what the Bible says. And if you read his book, he says it's because God didn't preserve it and he was never taught the doctrine of preservation. And then you have uh, scholars out there with the originals only position uh, that would also undermine anything, any kind of translation you'll hold in your hands and question whether or not you're ever reading anything remotely similar to God's word. Um, and uh, but then my favorite one of my favorite things about the series uh, uh, and especially in the book is you, you, Brian will step back and go, OK, what does the Bible say about preservation? Let's start there. Let's start with what the word says about preservation. And do you believe it? <laughs> right. And there was uh, one page. I can't remember which page it was. It might have been 
uh, in the 80s, I think. But you had he went through a number of passages about uh, preservation, all the stuff, many, many passages about preservation. It might have been page 81 here. Let me see. And then, um, yeah, like Psalm 33, 11. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever. The thoughts of his heart to all generations. You know, the um, uh, Psalm 119.89, famously, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Um, Isaiah 30, verse 8, Now go, write it, in, write it before them in a table and note it in a book, that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. Classic, classic passages. And I loved what Brian had to say about famously Psalm 12, 6, and 7, page 88. Of course, Psalm 12, 6, and 7, we probably uh, got that passage memorized. Uh, let me go there just so I don't screw it up. Um, the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Oh, come on, Brian. You know good and well he's not talking about his word. He's just preserving the generation, right? <laughs> That's what they say. <laughs> I look, okay, and I'm going to quote Brian uh, from the book. He says, what the doctrine of preservation, about Psalm 12, he says, what the doctrine of preservation assures is exactly what verse 6 states, namely, the preservation of a pure text, i.e., a text that does not report information about God, his nature or character, his doctrine, his dispensational dealings with mankind, history, archaeology, or science, that is false. In short, God's promise to preserve his word assures the existence of a text that has not been altered in its fundamental character or doctrinal content despite not being preserved in a state of verbatim identicality. I love that. I love I, that was a, a favorite of mine. So if you, if you don't mind, somebody that's new to the whole discussion, uh, how would you describe verbatim identicality? <clears throat> verbatim identicality is the assumption. So let me back up. Uh, people talk about plenary verbal inspiration, the idea that God inspired every word. It wasn't just the thought, the concept, the idea, but the very words that God gave, the graph, the graphe in Greek that he gave by inspiration of God, that he's inspiring the very words of God. Now, what happens is people then, they say, well, then that must require plenary verbal preservation, and there can never be any differences of wording of any kind. And this is what we mean when I say we, I mean Dave Reed and I by verbatim identicality. So I could say that I went to the store at 630 or I could say at half past six, I went to the store. The substance is exactly identical, but I'm not using verbatim wording to communicate that. What happens in the conversations about preservation, text and translation is people assume that it has to be verbatim identicality as the standard. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is you just can't sustain that across all of the different levels that are necessary in a conversation like this, because they're just, what the scriptures approve of is verbal equivalence, um, substantive doctrinal equivalence. They do not demand or necessitate verbatim identicality of wording. Mm. Um, the uh, I had all my life, it had always bothered me, uh, examples where you don't have verbatim identicality, where somebody quotes the Old Testament, you know, and it's not exactly like the way it's written in the Old Testament. That always bothered me. And I didn't I didn't understand uh, how to how to how to think what to think about that until your series came along for me and the, and the whole discussion about verbatim identicality. Uh, you know, you take, for example, uh, the, you had the example in your book, Luke, uh, Luke 4, Jesus in Nazareth opens the scroll up and he reads Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, famously ends it, mid, ends it in the mid, middle of the verse. And it always bugged me that you don't have an exact replica in Luke 4 with what you have in Isaiah 61. And I remember thinking, well, even... 
I mean, wouldn't the translators know? Okay, look, I mean, yeah, you've got, okay, so they translated from Hebrew into English, and it's this. And well, clearly the Lord is is reading probably Hebrew, and I'm sure it's translated into Greek, and then the Lord, and then it's translated into English, and then I'm guessing the Lord, well, wouldn't they know he's quoting Isaiah 61? So wouldn't they go to the trouble to make sure it's exact replica when they translate it into English? But no, the wording is different. And and that bugged me growing up. Uh, you well, have, not only is the wording different, but Christ. Uh, that's a that's an interesting situation there because he's hand he's holding a manuscript copy of the book of Isaiah. Yes. And when he's done, he closes it, hands it back to the minister, and then the text says, "This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears." That's right. But it's not a verbatim match to what it, to Isaiah sixty one, and it's not an original either. <laughs> the copy was called scripture. Yeah, exactly. Another one. Um, so I just have to do this. Can I present? I would love for you to present anything you want to present, brother. Yeah, All right, I'll display so. anything you like. I just, uh, that was one of the, and, that, and the way Brian explains it with verbatim identicality is something I loved because it doesn't it it doesn't have to be exactly the same wording so long as the it's the same thought and you can so have here's, wording to yeah. convey the same thought there so here's another one that i've just hit on recently that i find fascinating and it's this famous passage about the lilies of the field okay yes so here you have luke 12:27 consider the lilies of the field how they grow they toil not they spin not and yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these, right? And then you have a parallel passage in Matthew 6 where he says, um, and why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field. They grow not, they toil not, neither do they spin. Okay? Right. So the Greek in both of these is identical. The Greek, the Greek wording, everything is identical in both of these verses. But notice how the translators don't render them the same. Here they say they grow, they toil, uh, they spin not. Here they say they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. So Luke is more of a like a literal rendering, and Matthew 6 is more of a stylistic rendering, but they're communicating the exact same doctrinal content without having to use the exact verbatim words. Right. So the, uh, that is that would you consider that to be an example of the uh, translators intentionally uh, putting variants in there in the text absolutely they say in the preface that they did not uh that they did not use a uh, principle of rigidity or lock themselves into a uh uniformity of phrasing or an identity of words they say mm -hmm. that in mm. the preface so as long as a given translation captured the sense of the original language. They were they felt themselves free to use English synonyms to state in English mm. what the text says in Hebrew and Greek. Now, I had before you started that series, I read uh, Baker's uh, book on understanding the Gospels, which I loved, and I had one, uh, that helped clear up for me uh, questions I always had about. Well, you have two or three accounts of the same event. You think, and yet the wording of the things the Lord says in one account versus another account are different. And how do you explain that? And uh, uh, I think, um, you know, if you given uh, you let the Lord speak for an hour, he'll probably repeat himself a couple of times for the sake of clarity and teaching. And uh, so it could be that one of the writers or the Holy Spirit is highlighting uh, the way the Lord said something at the beginning of the hour and then, you know, at the end of that message, you know, another writer is highlighting something else in which he is reiterating that same point in that same sermon that he's given. Or maybe on a given day, the Lord has said that same parable two or three times just for the sake of, you know, people learning it. And um, it, would you agree with that? Yeah, the other thing I would I think that's perfectly plausible. The other thing that I would say is what I talk about in chapter 21 of volume one about undesigned coincidences. Yes. And, and the fact that you see the fact that there are specific places where the New Testament writers 
will say something that seems like a one-off where you're like, well, why did he say that? Only to have it triangulate with a, a similar type of a one-off statement somewhere else where you're like, wow, you know, um, that, that really makes sense. Right. So I give I give a bunch of different examples of that uh, in the book where that happens. Do you uh, uh, let me ask you another question? The uh, on this generation forever. Uh, are there do you think that there are books that have come? I mean, you, I think you have literally read every single book that has ever been written on these subjects. Do you think that there are books that have come out maybe in the last decade or so that have uh, shall we say, presented new information or uh, a new light on this subject that might change your perspective on translations or, or the King James? Um, and I'm thinking so, like, uh, go ahead. Well, I have never wavered from a pro King James stance. What I, what I have changed is my defense of the pro King James position Mm -hmm. based on what I would say is better information. So yes, in the last in the last I'll say 50 years, research has come out that is very helpful in in giving a more updated view on how we should think about some of these things. Three things I've mentioned this in previous times I've been on is the you know you have manuscript 98, which is the uh, the translators who worked on uh, the New Testament epistles. There's a document in the Lambeth Palace Library in Great Britain where their draft work is existing, and you could go look at it. Right. Um, another one would be Bod 1602. That is a copy of a bishop's Bible in the Bodleian Library at Oxford that has the handwritten notations of the translators in the margin. Now, I could, you know, you could you could see these things. Um, using, you know, the, the benefits of the internet and other things. Okay. So uh, I could just show you an image quick. So here is, can you see that? Yeah, that's way cool. Okay. So this is, this is Bod 1602. So you can see up here at the top of the screen, Bodleian Library, Bible, English, 1602. This is a 1602 Bishop's Bible. And you see these notations, this words written in here. This is the translators literally um, conforming the Bishop's Bible into what would be the, 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 the King James Bible. Uh, the Boyce notes. John Boyce, would you say that's a big impact yes. on the way we yes. think about translations? Yeah, I definitely would. I'll see if I can draw up Manuscript 98 quick. Sometimes this website is a little bit finicky. All right, so um, try to – so uh, Now, do you, do you see uh, the StreamYard? Is this what you want us to see? Can you uh, see it? I see a lot of uh, different icons here in the background. Is this the screen you want? Oh, hang on. Let me get back to StreamYard. Yeah, go back no, to StreamYard. That's, that's not, not what you want, I don't think. No, I'm going to stop sharing that. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I should have guessed you would have just totally taken control. Um, the, uh, uh, here it is. Okay, go ahead. So just quick, this is Manuscript 98. So this is, uh, this is a passage from, I think, Romans. And you can see their hand. So this is how they are thinking these verses should read. And a verse that's left blank means they're accepting it from the Bishop's Bible without revision. Mm. So like I've actually collated through like three chapters of Paul's epistles using that to see for myself and understand like what did they do? Right. How did they do it? And why did they do it that way? Uh, in some of the um, uh, discussion about all way and always, for example, you could see in the John Boyce notes that, the or, you know, I, I don't know if it was that word, but there were examples like that where even the translators didn't see any distinction or difference between those two, uh, shall we say, spelling or um, usages of that word. Would that would you would, would that would you consider that a correct statement? 
Yeah, uh, the example was in First Corinthians ten with end sample and example. Yes, right. Um, wh- where the voice notes indicate strongly, give evidentiary um, proof, in my opinion, that they did not see yep. any major difference in the meaning of those words, like some people, you know, argue today. Um, would you be able to, I mean, how would you, after having read these books, how have you changed in your thinking after all of this study? Or can you even begin to articulate any, how your thinking has changed over the years since you started this in 2015? So my thinking is changed largely around the arguments that are used to present the pro King James position, right? Nothing that I have seen has caused me to doubt, um, my King James Bible or think I need to lay it aside for a modern version. Everything that I have seen has just been a further confirmation of what I used to think based on not good reasoning. Right. Do you think that God has intentionally allowed all of this to exist uh, as a way of just challenging your faith? <laughs> You're going to trust I think, God on what he says about preservation and look at the historical evidence and still believe? Yeah. I, I think that cer- certainly it would be easier if like we had an original copy that ascended from on high and you know, had like an aura and a glow around it, and we knew exactly. <laughs> nice <what> visual, <laughs> man. <laughs> but what God has done is He has put us in a situation where He's requiring us to walk by faith on this issue, the same as we do on any other issue related to the Scriptures. Right. Um, the uh, um, uh, there was one other question. The. <sighs> Uh, we did our verbatim identicality, divine dictation. I really love the divine dictation section of your of your book. Uh, that goes back to around the um, the uh, that was a question I had when you were going through initially the different types of um, inspiration you had. And then I'm like, you know, verbal plenary inspiration, which I know everybody accepts, but I was always thinking, well, in the back of my mind, what about like mechanical? I mean, didn't you have with the, um, didn't you have with the prophets in the Old Testament, um, you know, basically the Lord saying, yeah, write this down, thus saith the Lord. <laughs> and you have dictation going on there. And yet that's still, I would uh, probably argue that would still fall under that verbal plenary aspect because you know a lot of these prophets had the spirit upon them which was probably designed to ensure accuracy when they were even doing the divine dictation or to help ensure accuracy i don't know um you have any thoughts on that well so mechanical dictation or divine dictation is ridiculed in our day as being an antiquated way of looking at inspiration Right. The problem I have with that is the same problem I have with a lot of the stuff people say, and that is, there. What do you do with verses where God puts His, where the text says that God put His word into the prophet's mouth, right? And He says, you know, the words, your thy words were like food, and I did eat them, and then I that the prophet speaks the word of God. So it's obvious to me that dictation was used as a mechanism, not for everything in the scripture. But I would not. I, I think it's perfectly legitimate and scriptural to view dictation as part of, not exclusively, but part of the means and mechanism by which God accomplished the inspiration of His Word. And I've got three lessons in the book devoted to right. making that case and explaining why I think that's legitimate. My favorite part of that section was when you uh, basically uh, did the. What, what does the Scripture say on this subject? Right. And you had the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ, the testimony of the law and the apostles, and then the testimony of Apostle Paul himself. Right. And going through and reading what the Word says about itself, I found probably some of my favorite parts of, of your book. You know, like, for example, the Lord saying in Matthew twenty two twenty nine 29 to 31, Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God, for in the resurrection they neither marry 
nor a given marriage, but are they as the angels of God in heaven? But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying? And then he quotes Exodus 3.6. Yeah. You know? And who wrote Exodus 3.6? Brian says, Moses. And Jesus <laughs> asked them, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God? He said, paraphrase, it's not just what Moses said or wrote, but it is what God said to you, which of course was through Moses. And Christ says that what Moses wrote in Exodus 3 was spoken unto them by God. God spoke through Moses. I love that. That was fantastic. Yeah, I- That's my big problem with a lot of like modern evangelical thinking on these topics is they, and a lot of times they almost disregard the scripture. Um, It's really uh, disturbing in a lot of ways. It never occurred to me before I started hearing your series that I need to consider what the word says about preservation first, before I dive into this whole subject. I had no idea. And, it, and, and really, I think that was probably between you and Jordan and the manuscript evidence, that was my biggest takeaway from it all, apart from the historical stuff, was just, well, what does the Bible say about these things? Never occurred to me even to try to look that up. And my favorite, uh, our, I mean, still one of my favorite stories, is, uh, uh, which we'll get in the volume two, was the story of Jehoiakim burning the scroll in uh, Jeremiah 36. You know, Jeremiah has that guy. I don't know how to pronounce his name. What was it? Baruch, you know, and uh, Jeremiah says, well, write down this. Yeah. Write down this. uh, All my write Write all this stuff down into a book. And Jeremiah basically writes. It's a, it's a first draft of Jeremiah. (laughs) And so then they, they take it to Jeho, you know, and they start sharing it with the people. And then next thing you know, it's getting shared with the King Jehoiakim. And Jehoiakim destroys the original manuscript of Jeremiah. And, the, uh, and, and, and when they destroyed it, nobody cared. They were not afraid of the fact that this original manuscript got destroyed. And then you get down to the end of Jeremiah 36, and the passages are just mind-blowing. When you get down there, basically God says... Um, I guess starting in verse 30, you know, thus saith the Lord of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, he shall have none to sit upon the throne of David, and his dead body shall be cast out in the day of the heat and in the night to the frost. Uh, Don't burn God's Bible. And uh, in verse 31, and I will punish him and his seed. Um, And then you get down to verse 32. Then took Jeremiah another roll and gave it to Baruch, the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote therein from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the book which Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned in the fire, and there were added besides unto them many like words. Yep. I love yep. and, and you had spent time talking about many like words, which basically reinforced much of what you had to say about a verbatim identicality. There wasn't exact copies, but many like words, it, conveying the same thought, I'm sure, using different words. And then you had mentioned in that in that message I loved, you know, God inspires uh, Jeremiah in, uh, uh, he re-inspires Jeremiah to rewrite the chapters 1 through 36 and adds many like words to what was destroyed in the fire by Jehoiakim. And then, yep. and, and then you go to uh, chapter 45, verse 1, and you say these additional words comprise chapters 45 through 52 at a minimum and possibly chapters 37 to 41 as well. That's um, There's a study for you. Go to Lesson 29 of that series and, and listen to that. That thing was epic. Sorry, you got me started. <laughs> That's all right. Um, I've, I've, I've drawn a blank on the exact verse, but... Um, then he tells them when they enter into the captivity to take to take the copy of Jeremiah, tie a rock to it, and chuck it in the river. Oh, that's right. I forgot. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I forgot the exact verse, but like what all that shows you is that like all this gobbledygook about the original autographs right. is a bunch of nonsense. Right. Because the Bible, right. the Bible doesn't teach you to think about things by having to quote reconstruct the original. That is right. not. The scriptural view of the matter. The it was nothing the matter, to God. It, yeah, it was nothing to God to toss it. That was and, and by, and because because he knew it'd be copied. And by the way, right. when Daniel is in captivity in Daniel nine, and he understands by reading Jeremiah that the captivity, the seventy years of the captivity, is over. 
how did he how did he have so he's reading a copy daniel's reading a copy of the book of jeremiah right in captivity that has just as much authority and force as the original right. that right. they chucked in the river when they entered captivity exactly exactly that i mean that is a a biblical approach to addressing the original originals only argument you know what right. does the bible have to say about this just brilliant that god has that in his word uh, to help us to understand preservation. I love that. I'm trying um, to I, remember where that verse is, but I, I'm drawing a blank right now. Uh, let's see here. I could probably, uh, I'm sure uh, if I had, what I need is a staff of people here. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, come to the rock, facing the rock, hold of a rock, the rock of the plain. Um Uh, somewhere there, I don't see it. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't if you guys can find it, it, that'd be that'd be awesome. I have to I have to share Amy Stewart's uh, comment here. Um, uh, I wonder if Brian wrote a book on identification, how it might compare to your book, Joel. <laughs> <laughs> I would uh, I would completely embrace anybody else. You you can't have enough books on identification, you know. You can't. Would, it would be chock full of Joel quotes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you have John, this this uh, John Snodgrass here says, "I'm addicted to Brian's voice." Me too, brother. Me too. I'm not sure why. I but I'll okay. I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> but I, I'm not sure why. Are you like uh, every other pastor I know who basically hates the sound of his own voice? Does that bother um, you? No, like I don't Good. like I don't hate it, but like it's not like I will sometimes listen to myself to remind myself what I said about something, but I don't as a habit sit there and listen to myself. Um sometimes I check to uh I I'll listen to the sound. I used to listen to myself a lot when I first started because I had a lot of critiques about the mistakes I was making, but um I have a hard time sitting through a, a message. Yeah. Um, Bill Barron's is going to be there. Registered and reserved a room and time for the Family Bible Conference in July. I'm going to be there. We're going to be at that. Hey, well, what's the name of that? Hey, Lori, you remember the name of the hotel? It's like <laughs> Crown, Crown Plaza. Plaza. Yeah, we'll be at the Crown Plaza. That's what I found was. the verse, by the way. Of course you did. It's Jeremiah 51, verse 61. And Jeremiah said to Sariah, when thou comest to Babylon and shalt see, and shalt read all these words. Then shalt thou say, then shalt thou say, O Lord thy God, that has spoken against this place to cut it off, that none shall remain in it, neither man nor beast, but that it shall be desolate forever. And it shall be when thou hast made an end of reading this book, that thou shalt bind a stone to it, and cast it into the midst of Euphrates." And that, so, so there, there he's telling them to chuck the original, Jer, the original number two of Jeremiah into yeah. the river when they enter the captivity. That's unbelievable. That's yeah. unbelievable. Yeah, I had to. I, I honestly, I had to play that message twice. I, I, I was so floored by that story. Uh, Persis uh, says, uh, "If you and Brother Bill, if you and Joel come to Shorewood this summer, I'm going to drag this messy body out of the house just for the honor. <laughs> <laughs> I I am going to wrap my arms around you and love you to death. I love you. It would be awesome to see you. I'm going to have my wife there with me, my new wife. She's going to be there. Um, uh, let me see here. I just let me see if we got any comments here, and then I want to move on to the dispensational." Um, book that you've been talking about on Thursday mornings. Um, okay. The uh, anything else you want to add um, about translations, preservations, the this generation forever books? Do you know how many books there 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 will be all together or? Um, thirty. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um. The uh, the last dispensational um, uh, the the last video you did on that dispensationalism book uh, you said at the beginning I was going to play that at the beginning and then uh, changed my mind but you said well I think the most important question here is how do people feel about dust jackets 
<laughs> Brother, dude, dust jackets are awesome. How can you as a book lover not love dust jackets? <laughs> so I like them when they're on the shelf and they look pretty. Yeah. But when I'm actually reading the book, I hate the dust jacket because it's just getting yeah. in the way. Um. Uh, Bob Picard says, my wife beats me up so I don't have to. <laughs> don't give Lori any ideas. She's smiling back there. She's like, yep. Uh, hey, look, Robin Scott's in the house. How you doing, sister? We're going to go visit her. She's sick. We're going to go visit her uh, at the house after I eat pizza. Um, Lori's going to do keto. Start with, we're going to start with keto uh, next week, and so I'm going to pig out this week. Okay. Uh, pig out big. Uh uh, Amy Stewart says, I've learned you don't jump on bad wagons. People need to slow down, especially in gray circles. Totally agree with that. There's a lot of bandwagons, not enough burritos yeah, going on there. Um, a lot of bandwagons. It's a problem. <laughs> um, where are you? Are your dogs? Where are your dogs? Are they outside your door trying to get in? They're on the other side of the door. Yeah. 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 Um, how are the horses? They doing okay? Yeah, I fed them this morning. <laughs> uh, let me see. What else is there? Uh, all right. So, uh, David Campbell's in the house. How you doing? He says, my King James Bible is superior to the originals in heaven. First copy is given to, to the apostles. I have all books in one book. I have chapter and verse. I have in dispensational order. Better than the first. <laughs> Um, all right. Now you have been doing on the, um, Thursday mornings, you've been doing a series on a book that actually, uh, ad attacks dispensationalism. Uh, I think, uh, the last name was Hummel, if I remember right, rise yep. and fall of dispensationalism. Uh, now my question, uh, to you Here's a question. Now, when guys like Hummel attack dispensationalism, my first assumption is that they're actually attacking the Acts 2 dispensationalists, and many of them probably aren't even aware that mid-Acts dispensationalists even exist. Um, do, you, do you think that Hummel even knows that mid-Acts dispensationalists exist? So I agree with you. Hummel is mainly attacking standard Acts 2 dispensationalism. He knows that Bollinger exists because he right. talks about Bollinger in the book, but I see no awareness on the part of Hummel so far that there's such a thing as a mid axe view. Yeah. I get into, uh, um, when I uh, started the podcast, I got, I si I'm signed up for Google alerts on dispensational dispensationalism, just so I can know any new thing that's published out there talking about dispensationalism. And I've come across over the years, a lot of articles attacking dispensationalism, but I don't think they know we, and I often thought, I don't think they know we exist. They're going after the Acts 2 Baptists. Um, and, um, you know, which is, uh, and I wonder what their reaction would be if they even knew about us and tried to actually have a dialogue with us about Scripture. Um, and I don't even know, and uh, it feels like um, that, you know, the assault on the Acts 2 dispensationalists has been pretty pretty harsh, and then the Acts 2 people have been coming out with a lot of books, too, that are really kind of harshly, a punching back at a lot of the attacks that have been hitting them. I just uh, read one not too long ago. Um, and um, what, um, so, and then in the middle of all of this are the people that know the truth <laughs> that we can get <laughs> asked guys. Um, and we're like, hi, we're over here. Come talk to us. We'll, we'll talk to you about the Bible. Come on. Um, so what's, um, uh, uh, um, what do you think is his motivation here for taking out dispensationalists like he has in that book? Well, uh, I think if if folks could see the, um, let me find it here, the cover of the book. Oh, yeah. You guys see that? The subtitle, How the Evangelical Battle Over the End Time Shaped a Nation. Now, to me, that's telling 
that what this is really about is, and I, I, I've, I view this as, as accurate that dispensational theology is going to be blamed here for a lot of like the current state of the evangelical um, block of this nation. And it's like all dispensational theology's fault is sort of the, the premise that I find coming through pretty strong when I read the book. Uh, so it's, it's, it's got a bit of a progressive political motivation behind it, I think. Um, all right. I noticed in the live chat, there's a comment about, I, you know what? I don't think I, I didn't miss the comment. I don't think we want to comment on it, Amy Chiita. So no problem. There was a question here about uh, <laughs> hosting short-lived video on the King James uh, that was on and off and got deleted quickly. Uh, I, 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 you know, um, there's well, there's awareness of it. Uh, they have talked. Uh, they're still friends. Um, anything you want to say about the Osteen video on the King James? Um, there's a question um, in the live chat. All, all I will say is that I'm aware of the video. Um, we've talked, he and I have talked about the video. Um, I, as far as I know, you know, we're on speaking terms and, you know, um, agreed to talk about matters related to this. I, I, from my point of view, I feel like there's, there was a good outcome, uh, from the situation, but I don't really feel it's probably a good idea to talk about exactly, you know, what was going on there other than to say, um, I find, I found brother Osteen to be very gracious, um, in the way that he handled it and withdrew the video. And so I don't have anything, uh, negative to say about any of that at this point. Yeah. I, yeah. I love, I love brother David. I love him. I, I got to hang out with him and Brian a couple of years ago. Loved it. Uh, I loved all the fun I had with uh, David Osteen. I can make him laugh. I love him as a brother. I, I think he's a, he's a great guy. Uh, you know, the pastors are all human beings. <laughs> you know, not, not me, not Brian, not David. Ain't nobody's perfect. Uh, we're just no. all in this together uh, on this uh we're all aspiring to achieve the same things together, you know? Uh, so I don't, I, I personally, I don't have anything extra to add to any of that either. Okay. Uh, are there, are, um, are there any other thoughts that you want to talk about Dave, uh, Brian? Sorry. <laughs> um, I have lots about- of thoughts on Dave Reed. David Reed, that's right. No, I'm just oh, kidding, I'm just I, yeah, uh, I gave him enormous grief uh, the other day about the app on his on his, his CBC app because um, the uh, he had you know you know David is I mean he is KJV only I mean he is <laughs> and yeah when the first time we had him on this podcast he uh, uh, we, he he grabbed a random Bible in the auditorium and somehow. I, we don't know how it turned out to be a new King James. And I have not heard the end of that for years. And then a, a guy in the audit and the, and the assembly pointed out to me after church on Sunday that he says, have you ever, have you seen David's app? Has, Cause you know, you go to the Bible section and it defaults at the NIV. <laughs> and so I, I sent him a text and, uh, and uh, showed him a screenshot. And I said, brother, are you even saved? <laughs> <laughs> And they, oh, I got a phone man. call from David and Stephanie. It was we laughed our heads off. It was great. I yeah, I love me some David. Um, you guys have been close friends for years. I think wasn't David your best man at your wedding? Um, no, um, I was in David's wedding. David was not in our wedding. Um, okay, because of just the timing of, you know, when we met and. We met, I met David Reed in the late '90s at a, the conference in Chicago, um, and then I didn't see him again until like uh, March 2021 at a conference in um, in Tennessee. And then he was dating Stephanie; they were engaged at the time, and my wife and I were newly married. So we kind of not only were Dave and I sort of friends, but like my wife and Stephanie. Um, 
became friends as well. And then we were in their wedding. Um, I'm just, I had, let me see here. I've got this. I, I got to make sure, see if we can get a comment from you about this other thing. Uh, and then we'll and then we'll close it down. Do I have here we go? This this I love. I love this way too much. Look at this. Look at this. Uh I don't know who that is. Tell, <laughs> <laughs> tell me that this is you doing Christian metal. Please. Yeah, that's what it was. That was a band practice back in the day. Do you remember the name of the band? Yes, I do. The name of the band is Mysterion. The, <laughs> <laughs> the Greek word for mystery. Oh, so you were the world's first Christian grace metal band, the mid sure. metal band. Uh, yeah, the world's I, I, first. Hands down, I don't think there's even any other contenders for that <laughs> illustrious for that illustrious title. <laughs> uh, was that Grace Bible College? You were in college that then? That was, yep. Uh, that was in the music room, upstairs in the music room at Grace Bible College. Oh. We were getting ready to do a – we did do a few shows in those days, uh, believe it or not. No. Uh, yeah. Um, nothing really big or anything, but, uh, yeah, that's what that's what we were doing. How many songs do you did, did you guys have like – I mean, you guys must have had enough songs to do a show, or did you just do covers? Uh, we did, we, no, we had, I'd say five or six original songs. And then we did a couple covers. Do you remember any of the original songs you guys wrote? Did you write the songs themselves or was that like uh, a collective effort? It was a collective effort uh, as far as, um, I, I wrote a lot of the lyrics, um, which I don't, I had them all written down and with, multiple moves and i don't know where they ended up or mm. I, i've i've lost track of them but um, i wrote the lyrics and then we wrote the music as a band the guy playing the guitar was sort of the musical guy as far as the oh, okay. the, the music yeah. itself do you remember the names of any of the songs or what they were about or anything like that so uh, one of the songs was about um in the very first lesson of Grace School of the Bible, Richard Jordan uses the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, and the Dead Sea as an illustration of spiritual life and how the Dead Sea has no outlet, and so it just collects all these pollutants and there's no life in it. <laughs> and he used, the, he used it as an illustration for your spiritual life that you can't just, you can't just take doctrine in. You have to also, you know, be putting doctrine out to other people or you're just going to be like a reservoir of knowledge that's just dead that doesn't go anywhere and so like that's i wrote awesome. a, I wrote a song about that that's um, awesome so i don't that's even know awesome. he knows that but um, <laughs> that's just awesome yeah. that sounds like a fantastic metal well, it tune. was a great it was a great metal song yeah it was it was pretty heavy and stuff Did you guys and, never um, record any of your stuff like privately for your own personal uh you know enjoyment somewhere in existence is a cassette tape i don't know where it is but yes there was a recording um, oh that's of, awesome of a few things uh let me see here uh we've got um cheetah says she's kind of new to dispensationalism just about three years now but i consider myself a mature believer very good doesn't take long it's, some, it's a lot of us. I think all you need the three. I mean, for me, the three big things you got to understand the gospel. Then you got to understand who you are in Christ and then right division. Just following the structure of Romans for me, you get you get that down. You're pretty good. Would you agree with that, Pastor? Yeah, um, a lot of. Yeah, you've got to have the core of your justification, your identification and. I've, what was the third thing you said? You I, right I division, uh, because right division because yeah. I, I just, you got the gospel in those first five chapters, and then you got identification, then you got right division, then you got application. So uh, I th I'd say those are the three biggies for me. Yeah, sure, I would agree with that. Uh, Amy Stewart says I sat under Acts two dispensational teaching and didn't know it until many years later. Right division is the key that unlocks understanding so much of the scriptures. 
See, this was my problem when I was young. This is what I despised about the way I was when I was young. Because when I was young, my grandfather, I was early teens. Grandpa gave me things that differ, lit my fire. And then I became this arrogant, condescending jerk because I got the key. I understand my Bible, and you don't understand your Bible, and you need to understand that Paul's the apostle and all this stuff. And uh, we've made the point here that merely is the key that opens the door to understanding your Bible. And once it, once you open the door, what do you find inside? Identification, you know, all this epic grace truth stuff going on. And uh, I just I can't stand the way I was when I was younger because I was so it's something about truth, man. You get the truth and it just kind of get a strong reaction to it. And but it's the well, key that unlocks the understanding of Scripture. I love what she said there. I agree with that, but, you know, knowledge puffeth up too, right? So if all you yeah. have is a head knowledge of right division and dispensational truth, um, I, I think there's a lot of people that struggle with that when they come to the knowledge of the truth on this stuff because they see how misguided they were beforehand. Uh, all right. Hey, Brian, you want to give us the uh, give us the gospel? How sure. does it take to get that free gift of eternal life? If you need any help, I got your back. Well, thanks for having me on. Um, <laughs> it's been a good two hours. I appreciate it a lot. Um, is it normal for there to still be 45 people here the whole time? Uh, actually, the numbers are kind of low. Uh, truth okay, be told, we were, uh, now that we're in the middle of summer, before summer, we were looking at 60, 70, 80. Uh, oh, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, But once we get into the doldrums of summer, the numbers are, are way, way different. Uh, so we yeah. were doing really, really well before summer got here. People got other stuff to do, I suppose, in the summer. But uh, anyway, the gospel is that God loves you and Christ died for your sin. And Amen. he shed his blood for you on the cross and was buried to prove that he was dead. And he rose again the third day, the victor over sin and death. And he's ready and willing to give eternal life to anybody who trusts in the finished work of his son who stops relying on their religious performance, their ability to make God happy with them, their law keeping, whatever other thing they think they have to do to um, earn their way into heaven and just rely and fall back and trust exclusively on what Christ has done for you. And it's really simple. Just trust the finished work of Christ. His death, burial, resurrection is the only payment for your sin. And trust him today before it's everlasting too late. Um, I love the way you end that too, and I might steal that someday. Uh, how about a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, Father, how grateful we are for the simplicity of the gospel that Brian articulated for his ministry and his family and the church family in Michigan. I just, I love these saints, Father. I love, I love the way they rallied behind the Rosses. Uh, these uh, last couple of years, and I just uh, I lift all of them up to you, and I pray, Father, that all these dear saints, including everybody in the live chat, everybody that's a member of this church, that they will all just continue to abound more and more in love. They will abound, that your love will abound in all of them, and, uh, and, th and that your love will abound in knowledge, in judgment, that uh, together as they just study your word, they will just continue to approve the things that are excellent. Um, you know, that they're, you know, embracing who they are in Christ, they will in their walks all be sincere without offense until the rapture happens. Amen. And um, Amen. I pray, Father, that just they are, they will just continue to be filled with the fruits of your righteousness, which are by your son. And that everything they say and do will just bring honor and glory to your praise and to the praise of your son. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Love you Thanks, guys. You, you tell Becky. I, I, I love that family too much. I can't wait to see you in July. You tell Becky we love her to death. And the son, your kids love them to death. All those saints up there at your church. I, um, I just love those people. And uh you take really, really good care of yourself. I loved having you on. So if you're ever, if you're ever bored, you ever got, you actually have time and you just want to jump in, you tell me you are, you and Jordan and David and a number, you, you guys are always free to jump in anytime you want. I, I love you. All I right. love you to death. And so you take really good care of yourself. Thanks, Joel. Uh, Thanks to everybody for being here.
All right, hang on for me, Brian. I'm going to end the broadcast. Hey, you guys, uh, thanks for joining us. Have a truly, truly bad day. What's today? Oh, it's Friday. So we will, we'll have some vintage messages tomorrow. And then uh, Sunday, we're going to have uh, Jay Montero uh, speaking for Sunday School. And then Pastor Hal is going to lead the, uh, the main service. So it's going to be totally epic. Come on back. And don't miss Brian. Brian had a video he posted this morning. Check that out. And, uh, and make sure you can you know, stick with Brian and both the King James, uh, the This Generation Forever study and Galatians. He's totally rocking Galatians out. All right. Take care, guys. Have a bad day. Bye-bye. Bye.